Welcome to worship at Geneva Presbyterian Church. We're so glad you're here. All are welcome here. Really, we mean that. All are welcome. Just as God receives all who believe in Jesus Christ, Geneva aspires to be an inclusive congregation, worshiping, learning, connecting, giving, and serving together. We are grateful that you have joined our faith community for worship today. If you'd like to know more about Geneva Presbyterian Church, text the word WELCOME to 949-575-8675. Messaging and data rates may apply. Do register for the next new members class, which is next Saturday, February 12th. It will be in person in McLennan Lounge from 10 a.m. until 11.30 a.m. Go to our website and register for our next new members class on Saturday, February 12th. Lastly, do pick up a hard copy of my sermon manuscript each week at the Welcome Booth or read it on the Geneva website, the Geneva Facebook page, my Facebook page, or my personal website, realtheology.org. Let us prepare for worship. I will begin our call to worship, invite you to join me as appropriate. We have come from different backgrounds on various roads to get here, but we are all here seeking an experience of the holy. Listen for the promise of God's steadfast love and God's faithfulness. We are listening for God's call in our lives. Our Psalter reading is Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Have faith, hope, and charity. That's the way to live successfully. How do I know the Bible tells me so? Do good to your enemies, and the blessed Lord you're sure to please. How do I know the Bible tells me so? Don't worry about tomorrow, just be real good today. The Lord is right beside you, He'll guide you. That's the way to live successfully. How do I know the Bible tells me so? Don't worry about tomorrow, just be real good today. The Lord is right beside you, He'll guide you all the way. Have faith, hope, and charity. That's the way to live successfully. How do I know the Bible tells me so? How do I know the Bible tells me so? I will begin the prayer of confession and invite you to join me. Let us turn to the Most Holy One and confess our sin, confident in God's faithful and steadfast love for us. 
God of the universe and creator of all that is, we admit that we fail to be honest about our lives and in the politics of life. Sometimes we are deceitful. Other times we judge ourselves harshly and feel unworthy of your call on our lives. Disciple-making God, hear our confession and those we now offer in silence. May we listen to you as well. Touch us with your grace and dispel our fear that we may arise with renewed spirits to serve you, our true sovereign. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Confession, forgiveness are powerful realities. That when we confess our sins to God, when we confess the way we've harmed others to that person, the promise is true that we are forgiven by God and hopefully in time, the person for whom we're trying to reconcile, with whom. So in the spirit of reconciliation and blessing, let's pass the blessing to one another. May the love of Christ be with you. Let us continue in our worship of God. Our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings, with two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me.
Our epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The Gospel reading comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, Listen to and for the word of God. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Let us pray. God, I pray that you would take the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, that they be acceptable to you, O God, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Put one foot in front of the other to press on, to press forward, to do what needs to be done. You can live your life out of a place of love. Jesus has given us the grace we need to keep putting one foot in front of the other. In Christ, we can do what needs to be done. Loving God, loving others, making disciples. And we can do all that needs to be done in words and deeds of love generosity, and inclusion. 
To live a life of words and deeds and love, generosity, and inclusion, we need a personal encounter with God and one that is ongoing. Believing is important, but unless beliefs transform us, beliefs are useless. You see, in Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. A personal encounter with God leads us to participate with God in God's mission. In all four texts, Isaiah, Psalms, 1 Corinthians, and Luke, a personal encounter with God leads one to missional engagement and intergenerational participation in love, generosity, and inclusion. William Carey had an ongoing personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Early on in his ministry as an ordained Baptist minister in the late 18th century, Carey was at a gathering of ministers for a theological forum on a variety of issues. One of the senior ministers asked Carey for a theme to discuss, to which Carey replied, May we consider whether the command given to the apostles to teach all nations was not obligatory on all succeeding ministers to the end of the world, seeing what the accompanying promise was of equal extent? Dr. Ryland, the senior minister, promptly denounced Carey. Sit down, young man. When God chooses to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. Wow, many times I, I see myself still doing things like William Carey did. And uh, I think those are important things to do, but it's hard to do them. You recall the Great Commission, don't you? Which is the other bookend of the Great Commandment, which states, and Jesus came and said to them, quote, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The command that Carey's referring to before he was told to sit down is this. Go, therefore, the word go is imperative. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And the promise that Carey referred to is this. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus said, to his disciples, go and make disciples. But he also said, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Simon Peter, like William Carey, had an ongoing personal encounter with Jesus. The story in Luke is set in the early days of Jesus' ministry. After a day's activity, Jesus paused at the lake of Gennesaret. Simon Peter, James, John, and other fishermen had just returned from fishing all night, having caught no fish. The text intimates that Jesus was some distance away and a crowd had gathered around him to hear him teach. So Jesus seized the moment to use a real life situation to teach the disciples and crowd about his identity. Shortly after Jesus and the crowd meandered over to Simon Peter and his partners. Jesus got into the boat and told Simon Peter to go out away from the shore into deep water and to cast his nets for a catch. Simon Peter did as Jesus asked. The text tells us that they caught so many fish, their nets began to break. Simon Peter called to shore for his partners to come out and fill their boats. He had been a fisherman for years. Simon Peter knew his trade. But now, with his bolts, boats full to overflowing, he had a crisis of faith. Simon Peter didn't believe 
that Jesus could get a catch of fish any more than he could. Simon Peter's sin was his disbelief. You see, the best time for fishing was at night at that time. But Jesus said to go out, and Simon Peter in his mind was like thinking, you're crazy. This is not the time to catch fish. But Jesus said to, and he went, and they caught fish. So Simon Peter's sin was his disbelief, not believing what Jesus said to do. You see, William Carey did not sit down when he was told by Dr. Ryland to sit down. William Carey stood up and stepped out and founded the Missionary Society to India. Transformation occurs in everyday life situations through believing, obeying Jesus and his word moves us out of a self-preoccupied perspective and experience of a relationship with God to a self-giving, authentic, and transformational perspective and experience. Yes, words and deeds begin to match the behavior of Jesus. Just a side note before I quote from Grady Parsons. This has been a lifelong journey for me, for my words to be verified by my behavior. And I'm just talking about human life. Sometimes my words of affirmation to others really don't correspond with my behavior to them. And that's a real problem. But I'm surrounded by people and staff who trust that we can tell the truth. And sometimes I don't react appropriately. But I want my words and deeds to correspond so that people can more believe my words because they see my behavior, living my words. Well, the same is true when we talk about the words and deeds of Jesus. I want my words about Jesus to correspond with the deeds of Jesus. And I think all of you know what I'm describing right now. In human experience and in faith experience, words and deeds matter. They confirm one another, either negatively, positively, or in a bewildering way. As Grady Parsons reminds us, he's the former stated clerk of the Presbyterian Church USA. He retired, oh, about, uh, I want to say, four years ago. Writes, in our connectional church, showing up is more than half the battle for experiencing transformation. Quoting him now, showing up may not seem like a large accomplishment, but it is. As the saying goes, 90% of life is showing up. The people of Shady Grove Presbyterian Church didn't just show up at church. They showed up outside the four walls of the building where many people have negative views of a church. They see as too judgmental too exclusive. So we have to overcome that perception by revealing a different picture of the church. Isaiah 6.3 reads, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Psalm 138.8 reads, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. 1 Corinthians 15.10 reads, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. And Luke 5.10 reads, Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. God's holiness is everywhere. God will fulfill God's purpose in your life. God's grace is your lifeblood. And do not fear living in word and deed the life of Jesus. 
Are you willing to participate in the missional and intergenerational life of Geneva? If so, be loving, generous, and inclusive in your words and deeds. You see, Epiphany, the baptism of the Lord, and the transfiguration of Jesus remind us that Jesus Christ has come for everyone. We are God's agent individually and as a community of faith to manifest. That means to make known God's favor to everybody. Jew and Gentile, male and female, rich and poor, Republican and Democrat, vaccinated and unvaccinated, and the religiously hurt, skeptical, and unbelieving in the world. Really? You are needed. Each of us must find our one way to serve in God's mission. And service is fun when we do it with others, young and old, in authentic relationship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, quote, Only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. Let me state that with inclusive language. Only the person who believes is obedient. And only the person who is obedient believes. Only a strong sense of a call to follow Jesus and an equally strong sense of purpose can accept the necessary losses that commitment will cost. My fellow Genevans and fellow onliners and fellow TV6 people all are waiting to experience an honest, engaged, authentic, welcoming, inclusive, and vulnerable Christian in their life. Yes, really. Amen. Join me in prayer. Almighty, once again, we pause, and first of all, we are thankful for who you are, God. And we give you praise for who you are, God. And we thank you for loving us, God, even when we're unlovable. We thank you for your presence with us always and your call for us to go into all the world and make disciples. And you promise that you are with us always until the end of the age. Our world is troubled. It's not different. It's troubled in different ways. Every year it's been troubled in different ways. Every century from the beginning of time. Conflict is real. How we resolve it has become even a greater challenge. So God, we pray for your presence through people who believe in you and follow you to be loving their enemy. Uh, to be quite honest, God, it's, it's naive, but I, I believe it. There's no need for war. There's a huge need for understanding people who are different than us, people who are more selfish than us. We need to understand what's going on. But killing people, abusing power, is just not right. And that's, that's everywhere. It's even in our own country, in our state, in our county, in our neighborhoods. It's, it's often in and through the church that the abuse not war, but very abusive things occurring in the church, which causes others to be skeptical. But God, we pray that Christians in word and deed could show love 
and pray for the end of hate and an opportunity to um, build bridges. It's a big ask. But God, we're praying for your mercy and praying for a breakthrough. Not only in others' lives, but in our own. We thank you, God, that we can pray. We can pray for others. We can pray for what's going on in society around the globe. We can pray for ourselves. We just need to pray. And we can pray in thanksgiving. And we can pray in intercession. That's for others. And we can pray with petition. That's for ourselves. And we can pray confessing sins individually, our corporate sin, realizing how each one of us is part of the human problem. And how do we let go and confess to you in order to be the healing balm of Gilead, to be a healing presence in the turmoil somewhere with someone with same community at some time. We thank you, God, that we can pray. And this prayer is really from my heart. You know, I, it's, it's, I'm not a professional Christian. I know I have a job as a minister, but you called me. But I was a follower of your son, Jesus Christ, before the call to ministry. And what's coming out of my heart today is coming out of my person. And I'm praying on behalf of us that are online or watching TV6 that we could become more and more the new creation that you envision for the sake of others. And to that end, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I hope you were encountered by God in and through my words of that prayer. That the Spirit was upon you, allowing you to think and feel a possibility of being different. Thank you for your ongoing faithfulness in your tithes and offerings. I encourage you to go to GenevaPress.org and follow the Give link at the top of the homepage and donate online or write a check to fund the operating budget at Geneva. Our on-campus ministries, our local, national, and international mission partners, the Deacon Fund, and the special offerings of the Presbyterian Church USA. Remember, giving and serving from your life wallet is foundational to our calling as Christians. Be generous, give, and serve today. <clears throat> Receive this benediction. We have gathered for worship. We have read God's word. We've heard a proclamation of God's word. I now charge you to go into God's world with the very stamp of Jesus on your life. For you will be the best Jesus that someone sees. So, more the, so may the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the very presence of the holy, loving, graceful, and mercy of God be yours this day and every day, filled with hope, peace, joy, and love. Amen.